Hello and welcome to News Click. Today, we are joined by Ambassador M.K. Bhadra Kumar and we'll be talking about the situation in Syria. Thank you for joining us, sir. Thank you. Sir, so some days ago, we saw the meeting between President Erdogan and President Putin in Sochi. And this is a very complicated negotiation. There's a lot of reports coming out after that. So, would you say, what was your sense of the negotiation? Would you say that Erdogan, in some senses, has got what he set out to achieve on October 9th when he launched the invasion? You know, very succinctly put, uh, an entirely new phase in the Syrian conflict is beginning. Right. Uh, just when Putin himself uh, put it on record, I think about uh, three weeks ago, uh, at a Valdai Club forum in, Mos in uh, Sochi, that uh, the Syrian war is over. And uh, now you find that... Uh, the parties who lost the war are trying to uh, maneuver in a, into a position to dictate terms of a settlement. Uh, there's a struggle going on there. Motives are very obscure. Uh, transparency is lacking, especially on the part of, uh, I think the Russian position is quite clear, crystal clear. But transparency is lacking on the part of uh, uh, Erdogan, Turkey. So a range of motivations are at work. Right. And the Americans have lost heavily and are uh, trying to bounce back. Uh, it'll be wrong to say, like, uh, there is a sense of uh, triumphalism uh, among certain quarters that the Americans have lost heavily and they are out of uh, Syria. Uh, it appeared so, but the kind of rapprochement that is building up between uh, Trump and Erdogan, uh, it shows that the Americans have other intentions. If you analyze, <coughs> you must first analyze the Turkish position, because Turkey being a neighboring country, immediate neighbor, Inevitably, it has uh, great influence on what molding what lies in the womb of time. Right. Uh, Turkey's considerations are quite varied. Uh, one is, evidently, we hear quite a lot about border security. Uh, secondly, in terms of uh, the um, Kurdish problem. Uh, the specter that is haunting them is that uh, the kind of Kurdistan that shaped up in the twilight period of the Saddam Hussein era in Iraq, in the northern region, might take shape on the borders of Turkey. Right. And uh, the Turks are quite right that uh, the Syrian Kurds, Kurdish group called YPG, YPG, which is aligned with the US, is in fact uh, a brand of the, the PKK, PKK. Separate, which promotes separatism and has killed tens of thousands of Turks in the uh, kind of uh, war that has been going on there. So that is, the Kurdish problem is quite serious. <clears throat> then uh, Turkey has uh, specific interests. One is historical. Having lived there, I can tell you this, that uh, it's an unsatiated power, Turkey, uh, in the sense that it has a sense of, uh, you say that about China again, uh, that it has uh, a sense of uh, humiliation, a sense that great injustice has been done to it, uh, this loss of territory on account of the Anglo-French conspiracy, the early part of uh, the last century and the settlement that took shape. And at that time, Turkey was very weak and Atatürk decided to be content with what was left yeah. as the residue and build a new modern Turkish state on that, on entirely different principles of secularism, Western oriented, mm -hmm. turning its back on the Middle East and so on. But you know, it's it's difficult to uh, it's difficult to believe that underlying this, even after one century, full century, 
there is this seething restlessness of uh, the loss of imperial glory. Right. And uh, particularly with regard to Syria, there is also the additional problem that part of this uh, so-called French mandate given by the League of Nations at the time of the settlement was that uh, the one province of Turkey bordering Syria called Hatay actually should have been part of Syria yeah. and Syria never accepted it. Now fudging this mandate, Turkey took away that province. So there's a territorial dispute also. So you see, all these things are at work and then uh, there's a refugees also. There. Refugee question right. is very much there. Uh, initially, uh, uh, when the war began, uh, Erdogan looked at it as a kind of trump card uh, that he can hold. But as time passed, it led to a drain of resources. Right. And, you know, on social sectors like schooling, medical care, housing, and so on, 4 million people additional influx means it puts pressures mm -hmm. on the social sectors. Mm -hmm. So there is a growing uh, discontent in the Turkish society that uh, these are unwanted people. Right. And uh, uh, politicians have to take note of that. So there is no question about it. It is a genuine problem that they would like to send these people back to uh, Syria. That is very much there. Then there is the other question. Uh, what do you do when a war has been fought uh, with the instrument of jihadi groups, extremist, violent groups, you can call them only terrorist groups like Islamic State and so on. Islamic State and Al-Qaeda were supported actually by Turkey in the initial stages. Right. But like a Frankenstein, it took a different form and uh, they lost control. But now these, uh, these fighters are uh, there in camps, detention camps. And these camps are located in the Kurdish areas and Kurdish people are, uh, fighters are guarding them because they are virulently anti-Islamic state. So they could only be trusted to see that these chaps are kept under control. Now what happens if, uh, <laughs> you know, they come back to uh, haunt uh, Turkey? Then, you know, the, finally the question is this, that, you know, that uh, Turkey has always had an identity problem. Uh, that its preference, Erdogan's preference, you may find it a paradox, you know, that an Islamist leader like him is also Westerners. Turkey has a split personality that way. And his own preference in 2011 when the war began was that the Americans should co-opt him and put him in the driving seat mm -hmm. in this regime change project. Right. Now, Assad was otherwise a close family friend of Erdogan. And at that time, you know, the, I don't want to get into too many details, but this was Barack Obama's project. Petroyes, General Petroyes, who was the CIA chief, was sent to Turkey to persuade them mm -hmm. to spearhead this project. Right. And then Obama left. And that created the first tension between the United States and Turkey. Turkey was left holding the can of worms, yes. you know. So you see, Turk's preference is that. And... Uh, then the relationship deteriorated with the Americans once they began this uh, alliance, dalliance with the Kurds, and uh, they started promoting a Kurdish homeland mm -hmm. in Syria. So a lot of bad blood. Then the coup in 2016 where Erdogan suspected that it had CIA backing. Mm -hmm. All these factors g got into play. But my assessment is that even today, uh, if a kind of a uh, deal can be offered by the Americans, Erdogan will look at it seriously. You know, he's, uh, the Turks are also not very comfortable with their uh, entente with the Russians because uh, the two empires had collided many times in history and they have a troubled relationship. Uh, so for want of an alternative, he is, uh, and then Russians are present there next door and the Turks have to deal with them. They don't like it. Right. that the Russians have established bases on their borders. Mm -hmm. It's a far more powerful military power. Right. But uh, so they need uh, to balance that. They need also an American right. thing. You see, Turkey in the Cold War era was like an anchor sheet for NATO, mm -hmm. you know, on the underbelly of Russia. And uh, without Turkey, people do not realize NATO has no future. You know, it is the second biggest military power within NATO. Right. Not only that, its geographical position 
it uh, you know without turkey the uh, nato would be very ineffective in the whole mediterranean region black sea black sea they cannot even come in right. without turkey's concurrence you know as per the montreal convention so all these factors taken into account turkey is an indispensable ally for nato that is clear there so erdogan could bank on this that even if he crossed a red line the americans will hesitate to act against right. him now i think uh, the trump is playing a very different way shrewdly he has uh, got an alibi to withdraw the troops because the moment turks came in he said that mean that the american troops might get caught in the crosswire right. and how can we clash with and the NATO. hallmarks of a predecided Oh, exactly. NATO ally. There is even a theory right. that you know that they were uh, hand in glove with exactly each other. Right. But in any case, uh, there is also the other part. You can look at it. It is also possible that the Russians and the Iranians encouraged Erdogan, mm -hmm. because uh, left to themselves, the Russians and the Iranians were not in a position to so get the Americans, the Americans out. out. Right. And the only way of getting the Americans out was Use to their uh, was right. to uh, uh, was uh, by to Turkey right. threatening mm -hmm. a military movement uh, move into northeast right. Syria. Anyway, what happened is the net result is the troops have withdrawn from there. But now the point is, uh, Turkish troops are inside, and Turkish Turkey is controlling something like uh, two third of the border with Syria. Right. And uh, go be going back to this imperial, uh, this so-called neo-Ottomanism, I think Russia has reason to be worried. Right. So the other question would be regarding Russia's uh, strategy here. Yeah. So they have an alliance with Assad, and uh, the alliance was successful in, say, capturing certain parts of Idlib I and mean, the, the the region itself. They stopped after again discussions with Turkey, and now we have a situation where Putin was uh, willing. To actually let uh, Turkey establish dominion over what is Syrian territory, so how do you think the Assad-Putin relationship is actually looking at this situation? Where, at one, on the one hand, they are very keen on re-establishing, say, the integrity of Syria. In fact, the same day Assad was in the Idlib region and talked about and had had very harsh things to say about it. Yeah, absolutely. So, how do you see them? How do you see this relationship actually giving some land away to Turkey? You know, uh, let me just make one point that, you know, when I used to work in Moscow and used to see this relationship in the Soviet era, they're supposed to be allies, right. Hafiz Assad and uh, the Soviet Soviets, right. uh, leadership. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, often, you know, we don't realize that the Syrians couldn't be pushed around at all. The Syrians held their ground and it is an ideological uh, regime. Right. This Baptist ideology is a very deeply rooted nationalism in a certain way. Leftist connotations are there in, uh, in a certain way, but you know, the, it is there very much. So they could, uh, they could hunger down, you know. Presently, <coughs> uh, Bashar uh, is weak. And the fact is that without the Russian intervention, he would have gone under. Right. There's no doubt about right. it. At the nick of the moment, the Russians came in right. and then salvage the situation for him. Today, he, it's, it's, it's broken. The whole country is broken. He needs resources. He needs a protector. So he's going, not going to be, I think it's unrealistic to expect that he can uh, take that kind of position of a Defiance, sturdy right. nationalist. Uh, you rightly said about pointed finger at his uh, um, statement in Idlib on Tuesday, where he called Erdogan a thief. Right. And it was the same day the that meeting was taking place. Meeting was so taking place. Right. So you see, <coughs> uh, Syrians are very subtle practitioners of diplomacy. He has, with that one remark, one statement, he has actually distanced himself from the Russian project. Now, Russia's pro dilemma is basically this, that uh, Russia has, uh, it's not only the Syrian part of the relationship, there is an overarching relationship with Turkey, which is also an, in Russian consideration, which is actually far more important. This is the only NATO power which uh, has moved so close to Russia. Purchased military equipment. For equipment, S-400. Yes. Now, you know, it's, a, it's not only weaponry, 
it also is a statement of fact that uh, that they are uh, because you see Russians control the system basically you know so it's a, it's also a statement of fact that you know that they are building a strategic relationship with Russia. Then there are business interests. Nuclear uh, business itself is, if I'm not wrong, uh, it works out to something like some $30 billion projects. Right. Uh, almost entirely, Turkey's uh, gas supplies come from Russia. Now, a new pipeline called the South, uh, South Stream Pipeline is a uh, Turk Stream Pipeline is uh, going to be commissioned in December. And this pipeline comes and it will make Turkey a hub from where Russia will uh, send the gas to Bulgaria, okay. uh, Austria and places like that. It's a very big Russian project, just like the North Stream going and touching Germany. Germany right. So you see, <clears throat> it's a very important relationship strategically, politically. Then another important aspect we don't see is this, that you know that uh, this high briefly mentioned Montreal Convention. Under the Montreal Convention, only Turkey and Russia have a say on the Black Sea. Russian naval vessels, they have a uh, naval base in Sevastopol. They can come through the Bosphorus Straits, you know, it's a very narrow Straits, you know, and uh, they will have to inform the Turks and it can, they can just go up and that's a, that's a gateway to um, the Mediterranean for the Russian Black Sea fleet. On the other hand, no third country is allowed to have a military presence in the Black Sea right. for longer than two or three weeks at a stretch. So after uh, informing Turkey, they take permission and send a NATO vessel into Black Sea. After three weeks, yeah. it has to come out right. and another ship has to go in. Right. So in other words, Turkey's cooperation is vital for NATO to establish a presence in the Caucasus or to the east of uh, Black Sea, which means, you know, a containment strategy against Russia is unsustainable without right. Turkey's genuine cooperation. Right. Right. So you see, Russia has all these considerations in mind and Russia also knows as a historical memory that uh, it's a difficult relationship. Turkey is a very difficult power to handle right. and uh, you cannot confront like that and you cannot bully like that. It's a country with a lot of uh, grit, you know. So the Russians are very cautious about the relationship. Yeah. They are quite, I, as far as I can see, they are, uh, uh, you mentioned, you know, that these negotiations were difficult. Uh, truly so, I can imagine that they're truly, and I watched the press conference there, they were very grim, yeah. both of them. There was no body language was speaking loudly about it. They refused to, they didn't take any questions also because it would have brought out differences. Right. Now you see the Russian worry is this, <coughs> the Americans, all they have to do is to verbally encourage this Turkey's imperial instincts. Right. And then Turks come inside and Turks stay put there. The Russians cannot easily uh, dislodge them except, you know, confronting. But for all these reasons, they don't want a confrontation and they don't want to break the alliance with the Turks. So this is going to be a problem. And Assad, on the other hand, you again mentioned that, you know, uh, is fundamentally, uh, Assad can never reconcile with the fact that, you know, that he is not controlling uh, okay. that region of his country. Right, right. And some of these areas mm -hmm. also m contain the water resources mm -hmm. and the main oil right. fields right. of uh, Syria. So uh, the last key player, the United States. So you mentioned how that it's too early to write them off from the picture. On the other hand, uh, except for the verbal encouragement uh, you mentioned, in the region, we are generally seeing a bit of a retreat as far as they're concerned. You mentioned that Israel, of course, is going through a tough time. Uh, their ally, Saudi Arabia, is almost on the verge of negotiating with the Houthis. The strategy against Iran has not really uh, worked out because uh, the the continuous pressure tactic has not got too many people. The other countries, European countries or NATO allies, allies are not joined. And you also have a situation like in Syria where Russia and Iran are very much in the picture. In fact, the discussions invoke the Astana talks as one of the key elements of the discussion. Mm -hmm. So where exactly do you see the US having a, a proper entry point or stakes in this current situation? You know, this last statement by uh, Trump, 
I think uh, day before yesterday. Immediately after the after the signed, S- Sochi yes, uh, yes, yes. Uh, statement, he claimed credit for the ceasefire. I claim credit, yeah. but that is you know Trump. So typical you know, Trump. And yes. also that is grandstanding in front of the domestic right, audience, right. because there is a lot of criticism that he threw the Kurds under the bus right, and all that right. kind of thing. You know, so he is countering all that and saying that I'm uh, I've done well. You know, this mm-hmm. is the message. Uh, claim credit for things where he didn't perform at all. Right. You know, right. that's right, but. He made a very important point that uh, he will have a relationship with the Kurds. And this general who you mentioned is a very interesting character. Actually, um, I wrote about it yesterday. Uh, you know, the, uh, this general, Muslim, he spoke very glowingly about him. You know, now, he was actually in the f- ranks of the PKK for 29 years. He is a hardcore PKK man. Right. And uh, now, an interesting fact is, he is also the foster son, adopted son of Abdullah Ojalan, who is the Kurdish leader mm. in detention right. in uh, Turkey. Turkey. Now, Ojalan is, uh, I, I, Ojalan was captured when I was there in Turkey as ambassador. Ojalan, and they have kept him under detention, but they have been using him. And uh, you know, he is a Marxist, he is a very uh, colorful personality, in fact, you know. And he uh, was quite in alliance with the Syrians at one time. Now, he is now acting, he has given up the idea of separatism. He is content with an autonomous homeland for the, within Turkey. And he is acting as a bridge between the Turks, between Erdogan and the Kurds. And he still has a, he's a charismatic figure. He still has a lot of appeal, even though he's been in prison since 1998, undergoing life imprisonment on a desolate island in the Marmara Sea. Even then, he casts a shadow on uh, the Kurdish problem, a larger than life image is there. Now, this man is his foster son. Now, he can also be a bridge between this foster son and Erdogan. Now, this general Muslim, Trump is going to get over to America. Mm-hmm. Erdogan is also going to America. So I have a feeling that uh, Turkey is uh, uh, pinning on this a kind of a modest vivendi between the Kurds and Erdogan. Right. And Erdogan was actually receptive to the idea of uh, a political settlement of the Kurdish problem. Mm-hmm. Initially, to his credit, it must be said that he tried. And then, you know, he had to mount the nationalist platform when he got into trouble with the military and all that. And it, then it became, you know, a contradiction yeah. and he gave up at a certain point. But basically, you know, he's open to that idea. So Trump's uh, thing is, this statement is a very interesting statement. What he is doing is, he doesn't want the military to do what diplomats can do, what diplomacy can achieve. It is cost effective. Right. And uh, he is going to use these codes to block the Iranian land route right. uh, from Tehran to Damascus. Okay. And uh, he has also said that he is going to keep a few hundred American troops in the southern region called Al Tanf. Yeah. yeah. Now that is closer to the Israeli side. Right. So uh, the considerations are: Americans will try to exercise influence over. Israel's security, uh, Iran's presence, and a say in the overall Syrian settlement, right. even though they lost the war uh-huh. and their troops are no longer going to be staying there, right. etc. But it remains to be seen whether this ploy will work because uh, some kind of a force projection is required uh, because the others are also toughies. Right. You know, Iranians have got militia right. and Russians are not pushover. And um, the relations between Russians and uh, the U.S. is very poor now. And uh, so, you know, th- uh, there isn't enough space for them, you know, and nobody is wanting a um, confrontation, right. but they are all jockeying for position. So force uh, power projection is uh, possible only through military means. They unilaterally decided that they will, Americans decided that their troops will come over to Iraq 
but Iraq has said nothing yeah, doing. Exactly. They want and they said that, no, they threatened that, you know, that they will take measures to see that the Americans do not stay there. Right. Because they don't want to get, like in the Vietnam War, you know, they've brought in Laos and Cambodia into the struggle. So this is kind of thing, and they don't want the Americans to put the shoulders on the right. Iraqi sh uh, mm -hmm. shoulder, you know, and fire at the Iranians. I'm very sure Iran has pulled strings mm -hmm. to see that the American troops cannot stay there. Now, if not there, then Americans cannot have a force projection. So all these plans that um, Trump may have may still come back to this, what you said that, you know, the overall picture is one of retrenchment. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching News Click. Thank <laughs> you.